To start off the discussion, I'd just like to ask you, uh, because you pulled together uh, different scenarios from the feedback you received in the CEM, what do you, what do you, are the main priority uh, issues that are coming out of the feedback from the CEM? Well, people can have a look through them and we've actually touched on a few of them earlier, but just I'll highlight the main points and then maybe go into a bit more detail on the other ones that have come up a lot with the members. Uh, one of the main things that came up was the challenges uh, that are faced by community educators in terms of this instrumental view of what education is for and then the, the focus on the whole skills agenda and how can you maintain community education within that environment. The second one um, was about the need for continuous professional development which I think we've addressed earlier in the, the discussions of really how we can maintain that social action model of community education. Um, the other points that were raised was in terms of new local education training boards and I know this actually came up in Tara's submission if I can remember correctly and how they can be truly representative of women's community education and community education as a whole. Um, and then I know other people are going to be talking about different areas but ones that I really wanted to focus on was the challenges of the BTI funding process. Okay, can I come back to that in a minute, um, uh, Neve? But just, I suppose, in relation to the, uh, this idea of the social action model of community education and where it fits in this instrumental overview of what's happening, especially in the SOLAS process at the moment, and some of that discussion came up in the continuous professional development discussion this morning. Reid, maybe I'd ask you, as, as an academic and as a person who has actually always promoted this idea of social action, like, how, where would you see, how would you see that issue uh, developing in the light of the, of the, the, the big developments that are happening at the moment? Well, I suppose one of the things about uh, working in a, a university is that um, we really are living in a sort of like a struggle in terms of what education ought to be for. So the, the same questions are being raised uh, at, in higher education as we are talking about in community education. And I suppose to me, the um, uh, one of the most important challenges is to uh, recognise our allies. That is that who is it that is working towards the same end and how can we cooperate with them? And I really do mean cooperate. I don't mean being co-opted, you know. I think the idea of, you know, taking somebody's ways of working and so on and just sort of changing them into something else for another purpose is something that we have to guard against. But we can still really talk very powerfully about who, whose side are we on and who else is on this side. So, I think that uh, we always have to reiterate that community education isn't just about the, as we were saying earlier on, the first three levels of FETAC, or indeed that it's confined to different levels. The community education goes right across the board in terms of the different levels that uh, we can operate at. Because, I mean, if you kind of think of what is community education in terms of critical thinking and social analysis and so on, these are all things that we will bring to every single aspect of education. And we embody them in ourselves as educators and we can inspire the people that we're working with to also see things in these ways. So, I'll uh, just stop you there for a minute and maybe put, oh, just go to transfer over to Liz here for a minute because uh, working in Ancasson, Liz, and I um, listened to you during the summer at an event that we were both at together where you were talking about the importance of qualifications and access to job uh, products and all the rest but that uh, community education could do this but in a different kind of way. I was interested in that because sometimes uh, the, the discourses are put against one another. <laughs> and and it's, right. You can either have yeah. holistic community yeah. education or right. you can and have so education. It's in practical right. terms for your, for your um, learners. Yeah. Uh, what's oh. your view on that? 
I tell you, it's very interesting because we all know that the funding is available out there if you're going to do skills and training. And so we draw on that funding and we develop partnerships to ensure that uh, uh, women and men from the local community can access skills training. And I have no issue about that. But the issue becomes one of how you do it and why you do it and what you do in that process. And I absolutely believe that you can bring all Breed is talking about in terms of critical analysis, uh, uh, um, social action, uh, active citizenship, right to the heart of ECDL training. That's right. Because if you ask right. the question of your students, why are you doing this course? Why have you had to come here to do this course? What's it about? You're drawing out immediately and going into the, a much deeper process that can really support uh, uh, and challenge so that people begin to question their own participation as tutors are questioning their own engagement in skills training. But it's a way of using something, bringing in the funding, which absolutely has what I would call uh, a very clearly hidden agenda, which is the agenda of social change and how it's up to us as educators to ensure that we can inform every programme that we're running with those elements. And uh, I suppose the other thing in, in, in terms, I think a community education uh, centre, our, our group, needs to really focus on all of the active citizenship pieces that are required at any given time. If you just take the children's referendum coming up now, how is that going to be something of significance for people doing uh, uh, a training in ICT or something? Well, uh, Phyllis, thank you thanks. for that. On that, uh, I mean, would you agree with Liz if I thought that it's possible? I mean, I know that you have a very passionate view of the social action model, and, and again, the challenge for us is to um, make sure that that doesn't get lost in the middle of the, the labour market thing. So, that, and Liz is talking about one way in practical terms. What would your. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with what both Liz and, and Breed are saying, and, and I'm really, I suppose, particularly interested in this. Kind of dichotomy that's drawn between higher education and community education, in this sense that you know FETAC is for community, this for the community education sector, and HeTech and universities, well, that's for for everyone else. Uh, you know that really worries me because um, ultimately I think what we are doing is we're directing people towards certain employment opportunities if we are going to look at employment, and also um, another thing we're doing, I suppose, is that I was reading, um, I'm sure lots of people have read. Uh, Stuff by Freire, but I was reading a, a thing last week, an article in 1987, where he was talking with Ira Shore about um, other people setting programs for tutors and learners, and he really talks about this power shift that happens, and you know all the power being taken away from the group who are really at the bottom row, away from the tutors who are at second bottom, and given with pe to people who are really telling us. This is the way it's done. So actually what they're saying is your way is wrong and we're telling you how it's done. And I was reading this and I'm going, oh my God, it's FITA. How did you guys know about FITA? <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a nice thing. But I, I just want to come back as well to another thing that, that, that really concerns me within community education. I find myself all the time going back to my entry into, into working in community education, which was in a project in Ballymun, a group of... 15 women who were all um, struggling with, with, with uh, drug use at varying levels. And I came in fresh faced from leafy suburbs of Dublin 6, uh, arrived into Ballymun on paper, reasonably qualified to do the work that I was doing. And I was paired with a local woman who had left school at 15, who had two children that she brought up in the area. And we co facilitated together for about two years. And she was the most wonderful facilitator. The standards of practice were so high, the, the critical analysis, the reflection, the authenticity that she brought that I could never have brought. I was an imposter in a sense. 
but because she was there with me, I was very much welcomed into the process and became part of the process. And my real, real fear at the moment is that people like her and other community shooters that I have worked with are simply going to be excluded. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not going to be just, That's a really important, it just leads into something. Um, I suppose when we look back at how community education began mm. in the 70s and 80s, and it grew out of that very organic uh, kind of approach. And, um, and I suppose all of those times we were we were competing for funding and all that. And when funding comes in, it brings um, terms and conditions with it. Um, and uh, I suppose uh, with the community strand, in one way it is a lifeline for communities, but in another way it has other issues. Nick, just would you maybe uh, summarize <coughs> very briefly for us like so, some of the concerns about the changes at the moment in the funding that's coming down through the Back to Education uh, initiative, just very briefly, like what yeah. concerns people have about that? Absolutely. I think, I suppose, when I hear um, issues that are raised from our members, they're always very much of a practical nature, but they all are, you know, small parts of a broader theme, such as about having your own autonomy of the kind of uh, community education you deliver. And one of the I suppose the most important thing for groups is in terms of funding and having autonomy over the funding process and ensuring that you can maintain it. And the issue with BTEI is, is one example. Um, we had a paper that we developed before and many people in this room were involved in that. And the challenge is, is that how it's delivered at local level is different across the country. Some groups get it as a whole piece of funding, other groups get it as tutor hours. <coughs> and what we really need is to have an agreement of how this is going to happen across the country. It shouldn't depend on your local VC or your soon-to-be local education training board. It should be a clear um, agreement of how this is going to work for community education groups. Okay, anyway. just Liz, on that, uh, again, as a person who's responsible for running a big community mm. education facility, you know, why should you have uh, autonomy over your children? Like, what, what difference would it make to you? And, like, uh, uh, have uh, autonomy uh, over, over the selection of your tutors, for example, or where you get your, your, your funding? I think it's absolutely crucial to have that autonomy. I mean, uh, it is empower it's empowering for the, uh, your students that you're bringing in tutors that you know carry the same ethos, hold the same uh, uh, approach, the, the philosophy that you were talking about earlier, and the experience. And that's, easy, that's crucial at every level. And you know, we've had uh, uh, experiences of that running heat tech degrees and having to bring in one or two tutors who um, are not community education tutors. And we've had to look at ways of inducting them into the process. And it's not necessarily uh, an easy task. But I, I think in terms of funding, can I just raise, the, at a slight angle, can I throw something in? Because one of the things I've become aware of uh, uh, recently is the whole absolute way the state has let go funding local community development. And we have a particular interest in community leadership and the way there is no funding really available for that active citizenship or that community uh, 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 leadership process. Whereas if you look at somewhere like the States, foundation after foundation after foundation are pouring, not millions, but billions into the development of uh, uh, local community power. And there's something around the collective voice of community education connecting in to the philanthropic mm -hmm. okay, yeah. yes that's here. and that is what will give you independence okay and so i think that's, um, that's something that we haven't really explored very yeah. much I, I, um, can i just pick yeah, up on yes, that because it's uh, such a really uh, important point because i know people have raised the kind of that question already as the whose side are we on question yeah. you know and i think it's really important that we continue to ask ourselves that question I mean, I don't think anybody would dispute that we are living in a very neoliberal country. A lot of people would say one of the most in the world at the moment. Uh, a million, a billion given to unsecured landholders a couple of days ago. At the same time as things like cuts to children's allowance are being muted, you know. And I just think that 
it's again, it's back to what Breed is saying as well. It's who are our allies? You know, let's find our allies, and, and they can be right up the education chain, um, and, and in the philanthropic endeavour, political spectrum all over. Who are our allies? And let's, you know, be as noisy if we have to be and as loud as we can, and try and in some way say whose side we're on. And, and influence change. Can I just come back there because you know you've been involved in this at the executive level, and European level for a long time as well. And I suppose <coughs> the thing I would say is okay. You, you can have a very good relationship with people in the departments, civil service, and politicians, and all the rest, and you will. But actually, their understanding of what you're actually doing is quite a distance from what you're yeah. So, in the way, I suppose, of, uh, uh, one of the roles of an NGO is to educate them. But actually, if you were trying in this at uh, this point where um, uh, to to uh, explain to Minister Cannon or others why they should include independent community education along the lines of Camilla and uh, Liz are talking yeah. about into this new system, what, what things would you need to be said to convince people about that? Well, I do think the first thing really is kind of like an audit of the influence that community education has had on the whole educational spectrum, first of all. Mm -hmm. Do you know that it's only when, uh, when you're as old as I am that you remember what it was like beforehand. Uh, you know, that uh, they kind of... Uh, uh, approaches and what we might call subjects or areas that community education developed. You know that, and these are have been influential. They've been influential right across the board. If you kind of think of even the way children in primary school learn now, in comparison to row upon row upon row, that's all almost like developed in community education to know that circles are much more facilitative than anything else. So I think that's the first thing. An audit of the influence of community education across the entire education spectrum. Now it didn't obviously do it on its own, but again it's kind of like recognising the allies. Who was it that kind of developed circle time for example in, in primary school? But anyway, that's the first thing. I think the second thing is to really uh, um, sort of recognise the, the full spectrum of the economy, that is, that the economy isn't just to do with skills and jobs, that really it has to do, if they uh, want to see it in terms, in those ne neoliberal terms, that the economy is the foundation of the well-being in society. We can provide them with the, the wherewithal to fulfil that well-being. I think the new area that has to really be developed is the idea of the collectivity. And I think that that is something that the neoliberal model will never really understand. And that's, I think, something new that we have to uh, sort of promote. That collective um, well-being, in fact, that the well-being of the nation doesn't depend on individuals doing okay. Yeah, it yes, yes. needs an entire community is doing okay. So we don't want to admit Romney on it then? No, Mitt Romney. Just on an interesting thing for us as an NGO in championing community education, we've managed to get across the message that community education is the kind of education that extends opportunities to people who wouldn't mm. maybe perhaps come into other, uh, other spaces. The downside of that is that uh, the, um, the power makers and the policy makers equate that with the qualifications framework yeah. Yeah. and yeah. say, okay, you can work at level, this came up before, yeah. at levels yeah. one yeah. to three yeah. 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 Uh, because you, are, um, you can attract people yeah. in, you don't have to put pressure on them for things, okay. But after that, they have to move into other sectors. Now, this, I think this is a big issue that's coming up for, again, for providers. Liz, again, as a, an organisation that provides level seven. Okay, the seven. Level seven. Seven. Okay, seven. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. No, no, but in, no, in, in not partnership, not yeah. exactly. Yeah. You're doing yeah. next year. Yeah. 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 That's a yeah. progression yeah. really. Yeah. Oh, it's real. Yeah. Yeah. But you're already doing yeah. third yeah. level thing. Okay. Yeah. Like, how, how are you going to? Uh, square the circle yeah. on that one. 
I think that is uh, uh, one of our, one of, not just Uncle Sam's challenges, but I think that's a real challenge for the sector. That we have absolutely got uh, uh, to strip away the illusions that the civil servants, I believe, have about what community education can do, can provide, should provide, because sometimes I hear a should, you should only be doing this. I think, and I was talking to Breathe this morning, there's also an academic arrogance that has got yeah, to be challenged. Be challenged. Yeah. I have found yeah. it. We have written two degrees ourselves. We have written the entire syllabus, got great support from Carlo IT. But I have heard people saying, who do they think they are to be able to write a degree. <coughs> Who do they think they are? Well, I can tell you, as with all of us, are probably have higher standards of education, deeper commitment, more experience, and really can provide a, a third level education that really meets the needs of the communities we work in. And we, that's part of the collective voice that we need to be challenging that arrogance and that arrogance at academic level and uh, uh, illusion at civil service level. But we also need to support ourselves and one another to believe in our abilities. You know, and again it's back to the collective and, and to sort of see, see how can we create a community university. And Brie, as, as somebody who works in one of these academic <laughs> 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 But uh, like it is a challenge for working in but uh, like as somebody who's in that space because it is a cultural, there's mm -hmm. a huge cultural wall there. Do you see uh, a possibility of breaking that down internally or on, on how would you go about that? I see two uh, strands of the attack, as it were, and one of them is illustrated through women's studies or gender studies. If you kind of think of what was taught in history departments and English literature departments before women's studies came along, you certainly wouldn't have gotten anything to do with feminist scholarship. So it's a gradual <coughs> sort, of, sort of getting footholds and fingernail uh, poles in the academy and really developing what we would call, well in the case of women's studies would be feminist epistemology, but in the case of this would be really the, knowledge, the theory of knowledge around community. So we can really see it in front of our eyes. And I do think that, um, in, that again to recognise the allies, that we really do need to develop the theory of the practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, of community education so that we really are getting a, a, a foothold again within the academy. And I think that we always say in any liberation movement, in order to be equal, you have to be greater than. Mm. You know, it is a mathematical formula. You have to be greater than in order to be equal to. But really actually, good. it does work. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to just about five minutes and then we can wrap it up. Like, what we want, want to do is to uh, sort of make a case for community education <laughs> that the minister's ears can hear. And, you know, we've done this quite successfully with learners, but okay, how, what messages do you think are the most important that you need to convey in a space like this? I'll just take this very briefly and I'll just go to uh, Liz and, and bring it to wind it up. So you well, I suppose it. sometimes I think mm -hmm. part, part of, yeah. <laughs> sometimes I think a, a trap that we need to make sure we don't fall into, uh, myself included, is relying on people like yourself, Breed, and other people to be the kind of spokesperson for us. Yeah. I, you know, I really, th you know, I think we all need to ask ourselves, how can I become an agent for change? Or how can we be an agent for change? Is it the kind of Gandhi thing, be the change you want to see in the world? And I think that, you know, a lot of the responsibility rests with us as community educators. We need to be pushing the doors in the universities and saying, here we are. I mean, Respond delivered a certificate at level seven in the community last year. And I tell you, it was less demanding than FreeTech level five. I have no doubt in my mind. 
and the, uh, definitely it was it was a better model for community education because it so allowed. So you're saying that's one way of convincing. I that think you can look at the models that you can. Well, I think the, the, the way we need to convince is we need to start acting what we want to, the community education to look like. We need to start actually living it, doing it. And then it's more difficult to, to brush a society. If somebody's asking why yeah. should I support yeah. in education yeah. or yeah. being funded yeah. or Yeah. Well I think we're back to the old question, aren't we, of being able to show the impact. And uh, I think finding ways that really shows that it shows that impact. And we can show it. And I uh, I think more than anything, it's the voice of the learner. Mm -hmm. And you're That's strong true. on That's this, Bernie. In learner is really present and active because that's what convinces Kieran Cannon, Pat Rabbit, any of them. It's seeing it in action. Yes. And I think that's. And brief, yeah. what just. I think that it, it helped Kieran Cannon to do that community education. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that's the very <laughs> thing. Uh, okay. Just kind of identify what other things that have come up, maybe in the, the general discussion, people will be able to address yeah. that rather than on the panel. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think everything we've talked about, as I said before, has a practical implication. But if we want community education to be able to be provided at all levels as a framework, Community education has to be uh, have the capability to provide accredited learning, and that my fear is about the new authority, the QQAI. Yeah. What's going to be their view of community mm -hmm. education? And um, that's something that I think is vitally important. Um, in theory, with the new system, you could essentially provide anything along the framework, which could open up the doors for community education to be able to provide this community university. But will small groups be able to become quality shares? That's a big fear of mine. Mm -hmm. And in terms of being able to provide that kind of, um, of learning, they have to have control over their tutors, which has implications. They have to have the funding to be able to decide who their tutors are. And what are the implications of the teaching council in terms of will tutors have to have a degree? As we mentioned before, people have come up through the sector and the value of their work. So in terms of having that kind of dream of what we want from community education, it must be autonomous, it must be funded correctly, it must we be able to provide accredited learning and we must have control and over the tutors and the kind of uh, continuous professional development that they need to provide that.